Okay, it looks like we are live. So hello again, everybody, and welcome to another one of Evotech's live biotechnology, uh, biotechnology training live streams. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, I'm D Dr. Danielle Snowflack. I am the Senior Director of Education at Edvotech, and I'm so happy to be here with you today discussing more about biotechnology um, and highlighting more of our experiments that you can do with your students. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, for those of you who this may be your first live stream, um, if you're unfamiliar with our company, um, we are the biotechnology education company. So we were founded over 30 years ago um, by Dr. Jack Churchian, a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, and, and what he saw was that the amazing innovations in biotech had not been being translated to the classroom. Um, and he wanted to you know, work with researchers and teachers to bring these innovations into the classroom. And thus, Edvotech was born. And so we work with educators all over the world um, to help demystify science and to foster the next generation of science, uh, scientists through hands-on active learning activities. Um, and we don't stop there. You know, we really hope to make biotechnology accessible to all labs um, you know, around the world, whether it be a research lab, an outreach space, a biohacker lab, or, or for educators. Um, so as Maria has posted um, in the chat, um, this demonstration is being recorded and the slides will be available on our website. So if you'd like to be notified when they're posted, uh, please be sure to fill out that form that is in the chat box. The link, in, uh, the link to the form is in the chat box. Um, and, and we're also gonna be offering professional development certificates for those who are watching live. Um, if you want us to send a certificate, just check off the box on the form and we will, um, we will send that to you by email. So the link is only live for one hour after the presentation. So be sure to complete it before 5.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So let's get started uh, with talking about cancer. Um, and so I think we, you know, I think everybody has been touched by cancer, has a connection to cancer. Um, and cancer is just basically, um, you know, the, a, a normal cellular process that goes a little bit wrong. And so all cells in our bodies and in other creatures, other cellular organisms, unicellular or multicellular, um, our cells divide to create new cells in a process called mitosis. To divide successfully, let me move my chair a little bit. Uh, to, to divide successfully, a cell must not only increase in volume, it must duplicate its DNA and its organelles if it's a eukaryotic cell, and then it needs to split everything evenly in two, and that's a pretty complicated process. And so this sequence of events, which is called the cell cycle, is tightly regulated so that the divisions happen at the right time and in the right place. The cellular division system, so the, the mitosis system, has evolved um, so that there are controls in place called checkpoints. And these checkpoints ensure that division happens at the right time. They block the passage of the cell from one phase to the next if it has not met certain criteria for dividing. And that keeps cells from dividing when they shouldn't. So if the DNA is not properly duplicated, um, or you know, if the cell hasn't grown properly, um, or if the nucleus hasn't divided yet. Um, and, and so these are all important markers um, in mitosis. Um, if we don't meet those checkpoints, we don't move forward. And so only when the cell has completely, has completely successfully completed one step in mitosis, can it move from one step to the next, clear that checkpoint, and then divide. And so the cell cycle is carefully regulated to ensure that a cell divides in the right time in the right place. And so, for example, if we think about our skin cells, our epidermal cells, um, those are dividing frequently because the outer layers of our skin are constantly sloughing off and that's protective. It helps protect our um, body from, you know, being, um, it helps prevent bacteria from being able to get into our bodies um, and so on. And so in contrast, the mature neurons in our brains divide rarely if at all. Um, red, red blood cells, um, which, are, which are interesting, they've actually ejected their nuclear material. And so when they're done with their useful life, 
they're, they're degraded and the components are recycled into new cells. And so when mutations in a cell's DNA change the timing of the signals that allow it to grow and divide, it, it can the cells can multiply in a rapid, unregulated way. And that's cancer. So over time, the overabundance of cells form masses called tumors. Each of the body's tissues respond differently to this, and different gene mutations affect the progression of cancer. So, sorry, I just got a text, got to make sure to turn that phone off. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this, and so as the cell, these cells are overproliferating, they're overdividing, uh, which is problematic because these checkpoints, the cells are not passing through the checkpoints in the same way. And DNA replication can become sloppy, which is going to create some mutations in the genes. Um, and this can result in cancer cells leaving their primary site, depending on which genes are turned on, and then they can invade surrounding tissues where they form satellite tumors in a process called metastasis. And so mistakes in cell, cell division do not discriminate. Anyone can get cancer at any age, um, you know, and there are factors that play into it, both genetics and environmental factors. Um, but worldwide, um, cancer is the second leading cause of death with about one in six deaths attributed to cancer and many more people each year are treated for the disease. And so it's a serious problem. Um, cancer, however, is not just one disease. Um, it is a group of diseases, um, and this group of diseases is the second leading cause of death in the United States, only behind heart disease. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's not a singular disease. And so as we can see here, cancer statistics from the U.S., this is, these are cancer statistics um, from the United States in 2019. And this figure is going to show the top 10 types of cancer in males and females and the top 10 kinds of cancers that are going to result in, in death. And so what we can see um, is that there are, they, there are cancers in different tissues in the bodies. When we analyze them molecularly, they, are, they, they can be different um, unless they are a metastasis. So if a breast, t a breast tumor metastasizes, it may go to the liver or to the bone. Um, and those are actually still considered breast tumors even though they're not in the same place. And what we can see is that cancer, the, the occurrences of certain cancer are different in, you know, people who are men and people who are women, um, because there are certain kinds of cancers that are, you know, based on one's genetic sex, like breast or prostate, um, which are going to be influenced by the genetics, the hormones, and normal sex-specific physiology differences. And so while we, these numbers look high, and there are a lot of people who are getting cancer and dying from cancer, um, if we look at where the trends, uh, the rate of death from cancer has been declining since 1991, and this is coming from better, early, better diagnostics, earlier diagnosis, diagnosis, and better treatments. All right. Oh, gosh. I gave away my next slide. That's okay. Um, and so cancer is going to arise from mutations in genes that control cellular growth. Uh, these mutations are going to change the way that proteins function and the way the cell behaves and divides. And by changing these things, it can eventually lead to cancer. Um, and so normal, in most cells, there is a surveillance system um, that when uh, there's a mutation, if a cell grows, um, you know, which in a way that is not normal, the cell signal to, you know, the surrounding tissues and that cell is destroyed in a process called apoptosis. Now, there are kinds of genes that, there, there are two main classes of genes that can cause cancer when this process of cell death is not, does not work properly. And so the first class we're gonna talk about are oncogenes. And so in healthy tissues, these are genes that are gonna code for proteins that promote normal cell growth and development. When we change the sequence of these genes, either in the promoter, so we're turning it on in the wrong time, or if we affect the way it binds to DNA or other proteins, mutations in these genes can cause the, gene, cause the protein to become active at the wrong time or in the wrong place. And so these gain of function mutations cause the genes to become more active, signaling for the cell to divide uncontrollably. Many of the, these mutations are dominant, meaning that only one mutant copy of the gene is necessary to cause this unrestricted cell growth. For example, if we're looking in a healthy tissue, the gene MYC codes for proteins called transcription factors that are going to turn on genes necessary for cell growth at particular stages during the cell cycle. Uh, when these genes are mutated, 
make, can continuously turn on these pro-growth genes, which is going to result in uncontrolled cell proliferation. And if anybody has any questions at any time, please put them in the chat window. Um, you know, I'm happy to answer them as I'm going along, so please don't be shy. Um, the second kind of cancer gene um, is, so if you see me looking over to the side, that's where the chat window is. So just be sure to, to put questions there. Um, the second kind of cancer gene is a tumor suppressor gene. And so in healthy, in healthy cells, these proteins inhibit cell growth and, and prevent tumor formation. Mutations in these genes are going to remove the barriers, preventing uncontrolled cell division. And so many of these mutations um, are going to be recessive, meaning that one copy, one mutated copy of a gene is, is not enough to cause cancer, to break through those checkpoints and allow the cells to divide uncontrolled. To promote cancer, both copies of the gene must be mutated. And so one example of a tumor suppressor gene is P53. And so it's helpful, um, this is an analogy that was shared with me, which I think is great when thinking about these types of cancer genes, and it's to think of a cell, <clears throat> and it's to think of a cell as a car. For the car to work properly, there needs to be ways to control how fast it goes. So an oncogene normally functions like a gas pedal. It helps the cell grow and divide. So when it's mutated, we can think about it as a gas pedal that's stuck down which causes the cell to divide out of control. So if your gas pedal is stuck down, you're gonna accelerate out of control. You have, you have no control of your speed. Um, in opposition, we have our tumor suppressor genes. And so those are like a brake pedal. And so normally it's gonna keep our car or our cell from moving too quickly through the cell cycle. Just as is so <clears throat> they're gonna push the brakes on when, when things don't look right. When something goes out of control, wrong with the gene, such as a mutation, cell division can get out of control. And so the gene we're focusing on today is P53, um, or the guardian of the genome. Um, and so this gene is located on chromosome 17, and it was in initially identified as a 53 kilodalton protein by SDS Page, uh, which is an electrophoresis technique that separates proteins. Um, and so because it was identified to be 53 kilodaltons, they called it P53 for protein 53, which is totally a clever name. Um, not really. Um, but, you know, after the sequence was determined much later, it was determined that the protein, its molecular weight is only around 44 kilodaltons. And the complicated structure and uh, the fact that there are a bunch of proline's in a row, um, you know, did affect the way the protein migrated through the gel and gave it a different size. So in the cell, P53 regulates cell division and cell death through its function as a transcriptional regulator. Um, so it's going to bind to DNA and turn genes on. Uh, P53 is an important protein in tumor suppression in regulating DNA damage repair, arresting cell growth, and initiating cell death in unhealthy cells. And so specific amino acids in the protein um, or residues um, are going to allow it to bind specifically with DNA. So sequences in the DNA are recognized by these residues and they have electrostatic interactions. And so when P53 binds to DNA, it's going to activate the transcription. So it's going to turn on genes that are necessary for cell division or cell death, depending on what the cell needs at the particular moment. And so in 1969, Dr. Frederick Pei Li and Dr. Joseph F. Framenti Jr. described a rare dominant syndrome after identifying 24 families with high incidences in cancer. And so with the advent of DNA sequencing in the 1990s, researchers were able to link this syndrome to, the P50, to, to mutations in the P53 gene. And it was found that most mutations in this gene were located in the central region of P53, which is where the protein can bind to DNA and turn on transcription um, and turn on transcription. And so in human cancer genomes, uh, mutations are detected high in high frequency in these hotspots. In fact, nearly 95% of the P53 mutations are going, to occur, uh, are going to occur within this central region of the protein. And so by changing the DNA sequence, we can change the amino acid sequence, which is then going to affect the residues that contact DNA and form those interstatic interact electrostatic interactions. So today we are going to talk about cancer using a few techniques that we use in the biotechnology lab. Uh, first, we are going to explore cancer genetics here by creating a pedigree and performing agrose gel electrophoresis. 
I'm focusing on Kit 314 here, um, which talks about um, a patient who has colon cancer, but we do offer a second kit, number 115, which talks about patients with breast cancer. And so the experiments are similar. One has a fluorescent DNA dye included, um, and it also has chromatograms. The other it had just includes our flash blue dye um, and a different way to look at DNA sequences, um, but both are gonna kind of give you a similar experience. Um, we are also going to look at some pictures that allow us to see differences um, in cells, um, which are going to be some of the hallmarks of cancer. So those cell changes before, while they're dividing and growing rapidly. And we're also going to determine valor, our patient's children's genetic risk by sequencing their P53 gene. And so we are going to analyze the gene. Oh, oh. Here's an animation I forgot I had. So today we're talking about a 44-year-old woman, Valerie, who has presented to the oncologist um, with polyps on her, found during her routine colonoscopy. Um, you know, this is, some, we're gonna talk through the information that is made available as part of a diagnosis by the family physician and oncologist. Um, so this woman um, had polyps on her colon. They were biopsied, meaning that small samples of the tissue were removed for closer examination. Um, by doctors, and after this was done, uh, the polyps were shown to be neoplastic, meaning they're precancerous. So we are going to determine first, you know, whether there's a family history of cancer by building a pedigree. Next, we're going to look at the biopsy samples to, to look at both the shape of the cancer cells and its DNA content to determine what mutations are present. And then we're going to look at Valerie's children's DNA to determine their cancer risk. So we're going to do the DNA analysis using RIFLIP analysis. Um, and so you may be familiar with that if you attended uh, the DNA fingerprinting workshops. I'm not going to go into all the details because I've covered that in a couple of our previous workshops. But if you're interested, definitely check out our previous live streams. Um, but in brief, RIFLIP is going to stand for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. And so what does this mean? So if we kind of step back, um, and think about the name. So our restriction, our restriction enzyme um, is an endonuclease or an enzyme that cuts DNA and it's highly specific. And so it cuts DNA into fragments based on its sequence. And think of molecular scissor that can only cut at a very specific place. And so the sequence has to be exactly the same for us to be able to digest the DNA. And so for example, here on the screen, we have the ECHOR1 uh, recognition sequence, which is G-A-A-T-T-C. And so the, let's say that we have a polymorphism, so a difference in the DNA um, at one of the A's. So where, like let's say the second A, and so if the possibility is that in healthy cells we have a T there and in mutated cells we have an A. And so when we have an A in that location, so when the DNA is mutated, um, we are able to cut the DNA and get two fragments by electrophoresis. So if we look at this schematic, um, which is actually showing us results from electrophoresis, um, you know, we can see that we have a segment of DNA that we've amplified and it's between those two arrows. And so there are two potential reflips here, one indicated by the yellow arrow in sample A and one by the red arrow in sample B. Um, if we were to isolate this gel DNA and run it on a gel, it would look exactly the same. But when we digest it, you know, what we see is that we can get different results. And so we could imagine um, if these were two potential polymorphisms, you know, we would be able to distinguish the difference between them um, because we would get different bands on the gel, different banding patterns. So in A, you can see that the cut site is closer to the middle, um, and that suggests and that suggests A because our two DNA fragments are around the same size if we look in lane A. It B, it's closer to one of the ends, so we have a much larger piece and a much smaller piece. And so the difference in this pattern allows us to distinguish whether a mutation is present in a gene. And so when we look at Valerie's DNA um, using RIFLIP analysis, this, this is what we're going to see. And so in the, um, in the lesson, you, we, are, we are simulating um, that we have taken DNA from uh, Valerie's blood, from a t her tumor, and then from tissue surrounding the tumor. We've amplified it, the specific region of the P53 gene using PCR. 
Um, and then we have, we're going to digest it using a specific enzyme that recognizes the mutant sequence that is found at the hotspot codon at position 248. Um, in the p53 gene. And what that does is it changes, um, uh, changes the DNA sequence from a CGG to a TGG. Um, and that's gonna change our protein sequence from an arginine to a tryptophan. And so these are different, these are different amino acids. Their interactions with DNA are different, um, meaning that the binding is gonna be different and we're gonna turn on the genes in a different way. And so the change in DNA actually allows the restriction enzyme BSR1 to, subject, to selectively digest the mutant DNA sequence. So if P53 is a mutation in this specific location, we have the restriction enzyme and the DNA digests. The normal DNA sequence at this location cannot be cut by this enzyme because it's not recognized by the enzyme. So today we are going to use electrophoresis to analyze the, rif the RIFLIP analysis of Valerie's DNA. And so this is a technique that uses a porous matrix and an electrical current to separate DNA fragments by size. And so this slide gives an overview of what electrophoresis looks like. Um, if you want more about the specifics, um, again, please refer to one of our previous live streams or one of our other videos. Um, but I really wanna get the gel, start loading the gel so that we can analyze the results. And so I'm gonna use our Edvotech Edge today. Oops, we're getting fired. I'm gonna use our Edvotech Edge today. Um, and while, well, let me switch over to my working camera. All right. Um, our Edvotech Edge is our new electrophoresis chamber. Um, it is an all-in-one unit. The power supply, the, um, and the power supply, the um, light visualization system, and the, um, Gel, the um, electrophoresis chamber all in one unit, um, which is great because it's compact, it's easy to stack in your lab, it's easy to store. Um, you know, each student group would get one of these units um, to perform their experiment. I cast the gel um, using our casting system, um, which has the rubber end caps and um, combs. Um, and the one thing I really love about the EDGE system, as opposed to other systems that are these all-in-one systems, is the wells are large. Um, and one thing I found is that with some of the other systems where the wells are smaller, it's actually really hard to load these gels unless you're more experienced. Um, and so for students, <clears throat> for students who are just starting electrophoresis, um, let me get those bubbles out of the wells. Um, for students who are just starting electrophoresis, you're going to want to have a larger well to make it easier for them to load the samples. Um, with the 314 kit, um, the samples are going to come in tubes like this. Um, so you're going to get bulk samples. Um, and then I have kind of modeled what it looks like when you aliquot them for your students. So each student is going to get an aliquot and we're going to load the DNA sample on the gel. And so our samples, um, in this case, are DNA samples. Um, electrophoresis itself is a very versatile technique. It can be used to separate lots of different molecules, including nucleic acid, um, you know, DNA or RNA. We can use it for proteins, dyes, and other molecules. And so what you can see is I'm loading now using an adjustable volume pipette. Um, it is a precision tool that allows us to measure and deliver specific amounts of liquid um, to a um, to a, pl a place, either a tube or a well, like I'm doing now. Um, these DNA samples are pre-mixed with DNA loading dye. Um, so if we just have DNA in water, it's going to be the same density as our electrophoresis buffer. And when we load these samples, they would just fly out of the wells. Um, in this case, because we have added this buffer. The buffer has a glycerol. It makes it heavier than water. Um, and the samples then go into the well. The buffer we use in electrophoresis, it's a mixture of salt and buffer. Um, and this is important because for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, water is a really poor conductor of electricity. Um, so we need to have salt in there um, in order for the electricity to flow. Uh, the next reason is because we want to keep our DNA um, at a neutral pH so that it remains charged and so that it can be influenced by the electricity um, that is moving through the gel. So augurose is our medium for separation and we can think of it as like a science jello. 
Um, and that's going to act like a strainer or a sieve, which is going to help us separate molecules by size. And let me get my last sample in there. Um, this is the electrophoresis chamber itself. We've got electrodes at either end. Um, and so these electrodes um, are going to generate the current that is going to flow through the gel, um, moving the DNA from our negative electrode to our positive electrode. And the separation is going to happen in the gel. Um, in this, we don't have leads. Our leads are right here. Um, this is where the current is going to, where the electrophoresis chamber connects into the power supply um, of the Edvotech edge. We're going to close the lid here. Um, let me move this so that you can see me setting it. So here are our setting controls. I'm going to set it to 150. I'm going to just set it. We've got 30 minutes left. I'm just going to set it to run the entire 30 minutes so that if I'm talking, it's still running. Um, but most of these experiments, you'll see separation in, you know, 10 minutes, really, you'll be able to see the results. Um, I'm going to hit start. That is going to start the timer. That is going to start the current running through here. Um, and so just for reference, uh, let me turn on the light. Um, that is going to be the light. Um, that is the blue light that is exciting the CyberSafe DNA stain that I have put into the gel. Um, and I'll talk more about what CyberSafe does. Um, but in brief, it is a DNA stain that allows us to visualize the DNA. Now let me turn my sample light off. I'll turn that back on again. It makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on in there. Um, I'm going to leave the camera on this gel so you can see the samples as they begin to divide. Um, but I am going to keep talking about cancer at this point while the cells are dividing. All right. Oh, what did I just do? Wrong thing. Okay, here we go. I'm trying to advance the slide and I just changed to a different view in my software, my streaming software. Sorry about that. I am still here. Um, so if we were acting as clinicians, um, before we were even going to do the DNA test, um, what we would do is we would take a family history and construct a pedigree, uh, which is a diagram that describes the relationships between individuals. Um, if we look here, each symbol represents a person, the squares are the circles, um, and the lines between the, the shapes are going to represent relationships. We start building the pedigree from the patient and then build out to other family members. Each person is annotated with their disease status. And so when we're done, we can analyze the trends to determine whether cancer is inherited or whether the mutations occur spontaneously. So most cancers um, result from acquired or somatic mutations, which are changes in the DNA sequence that happen during a person's lifetime, and those are gonna be in the cells of their body. Um, these changes occur either through exposure to mutagens that change DNA sequence or through just normal errors, DNA replication. You know, it happens um, very infrequently based on proofreading in our polymerases, but it does happen. Um, in contrast, we have germline mutations that are directly inherited through DNA changes that can be passed from one generation to the next as they are present in the gametes. And so as a result, they appear more common frequently between fam among family members. Um, and so... I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm going to do a little pedigree building with you, go through what we, a couple people, um, you know, let me turn this light off. We will come back to it in a minute. Um, I'm going to move this out of the way um, and kind of do this here. All right, so let's build some pedigree. Where did my paper go? I had a paper and a marker already. Oh, I see it. Okay, here we go. Um, so to start out, you know, we have Valerie. Um, Valerie is a person who is female. So she, and she has cancer, so she's going to start as a circle. Um, and we are going to go up to her parents. So we're going to indicate um, our parents' relationship to children through this vertical line. And so Valerie is going to have, does Valerie have siblings? Let me, yes, we do have, Valerie does have a sibling. So we're gonna see here, he is a brother. So he is a square, he's male and he, so he's a square and he was treated for cancer. So he's also gonna be a square. And then their parents, so Valerie's father did not have any problems, but her mother, 
also had colon cancer at one point. So they're going to, she's going to be denoted as a circle. So let's see. So her maternal grandmother, so that's going to, we're going to come up from here. And so the maternal grandmother will be a circle. So let me just note Valerie here. And so if you were doing this with your students, your students would be writing down each name of the person and the cancer diagnosis. Um, but, you know, I'm just trying to, um, I'm just trying to work through the process that I would use, um, not get caught up in all of the details. Um, so this is going to be um, her maternal grandmother, Elsie, um, and she died. So if a person is deceased, you cross them out with a line. Um, that's generally how you indicate it. A person who has a line across them is deceased. Um, if they don't have a line through, then they are not deceased. Um, the filled circle, again, denotes disease. Um, you know, a circle is going to be a, a person who is female. Um, a square is going to be male. Um, and so, again, these, these sideways lines are siblings here. Um, here, it's denoting marriage. And with the Sharpie, it's really hard to see that I wrote the word marriage, but trust me, that's what it says. Um, and so we just keep building like this. So, um, you know, Valerie's mother is Diane. So Diane actually had a sister who was here who died at a young age. And then who else do we have? Because so... And so we would just continue building this way um, and going through um, until we have um, a full pedigree. Um, and there's just one more um, symbol that I don't have on here that we are going to want to, um, you know, look at um, and make sure we use in the pedigrees. And that is going to be if we have a half circle, a half shaded circle or square. And so this is going to indicate that a person is a carrier. Um, and what a carrier means is that they have potential to have the cancer. So they would have one copy of the cancer gene. Does that all make sense about how we start forming these relationships? It's kind of like a puzzle. Um, and you might have to go through a couple drafts until you get it to work out right. But what we have here, oh, oop, I went too far. And, and here is um, the com Valerie's completed pedigree. And so we look at this pedigree to determine whether there is a genetic um, relationship to Valerie's cancer. And what we see after looking at the pedigree is that yes, the, the pedigree does identify that there is a genetic component to the cancer because we can trace the frequent occurrences of different cancers among her family members. Uh, next, you know, we want to see whether she has this Lee Fermenti syndrome, which is this P50, genetic P53 cancer that was identified previously. Um, and so the criteria are here on the slide. And again, we can say, yes, she likely does have the Lee Fermenti syndrome um, because she does meet the criteria. First, she was diagnosed with a cancer that frequently occurs in individuals with LFS. And, and more of this information is spe spelled out in the kit literature as well. Um, you get a little bit more of the history of the disease um, and Valerie's situation. Um, but we do know that Valerie's mother was um, diagnosed with cancer at age 39. So that is the second um, criteria that an immediate relative was diagnosed with cancer. And then several of her second degree relatives, including her grandmother, her aunt, and her uncle were also diagnosed with cancer before the age of 45. So these things together suggest there is a genetic component to Valerie's cancer. So we've done the pedigree. Um, now let's look at the cells. And so I'm not actually doing the cell staining today um, because I don't have the right uh, equipment set up um, microscope here. Um, but I am going to walk you through the growth characteristics of cells and then what our cell culture experiments look like. And so while uncontrolled cell growth is the defining characteristic of cancer, there are several additional qualities that are going to distinguish cancer cells from their normal counterparts. And so, for example, Normal cells are difficult, notoriously difficult for scientists to grow in the laboratory. They are very sensitive to the cell culture conditions and they demand special treatment and media. Additionally, normal cells will only divide a few times in culture before basically stopping their division and dying. In contrast, 
Tumor cells are often much easier to culture. They readily proliferate in the laboratory and they divide in, indefinitely. And so, um, you know, if we want to talk a little bit about bioethics, we can, um, you know, not in this live stream necessarily, but we can talk um, with our students about Henrietta Lacks and the HeLa cell lines that were derived from her cells um, and are still being used in the laboratories today. Another important distinction between normal cells and cancer cells concerns a mechanism known as contact inhibition. So normal cells will divide until they are in contact with their neighboring cells, at which point they stop growing. Thus, contact inhibition will result in a sheet of cells that's just one layer thick, which we call a monolayer. Cancer cells lose this contact inhibition, which is causing them to pile up and form masses or tumors. And in addition, cancer cells become less adherent both to other cells and the extracellular matrix. So they don't really stick to each other and they don't stay in place as easily. And so this occurs as a result of the changes in cell surface proteins, which basically changes the way a cell can connect with, it, with surrounding cells in, in the environment. So changes in adherence and contact inhibition allow cancer cells to migrate away from the original tumor and so that they can grow in other parts of the body, which is again, that process called metastasis. Um, and I just want to take a quick second before I continue. Um, what you can see here is that our cell, our samples are dividing. And so we can already see to start to see results and it's barely been 10 minutes with our, with our division, with our, not with our division, I'm thinking about cells, um, with our electrophoresis. All right. So in general, so along with the genomic alterations and accelerated growth, uh, we can use these physical characteristics to identify cancer cells. The nuclear structure of cancer cells undergo changes that result in a large, regular shape, irregularly shaped nucleus and modifications to the chromosome. Um, these mor morphological characteristics have been considered the gold standard for diagnosing cancer. In general, normal cells have a regular or ellipsoid shell shape, while cancer cells are often irregular and contoured. De decreased adherence in cancer cells, as I mentioned before, leads to this disorganization um, in both the cell monolayer um, and also the number of cell-to-cell -cell contacts. In, in contrast, normal cells grow as a uniform layer of cells with many tight connections. And so we have the changes to the nuclear lamina protein, so the, the um, proteins that basically keep our nucleus nice and compact. Um, and perform, provide mechanical support for our cells. Um, and changes to these proteins also affect chromatin organization, which then in turn alters gene expression. And then cancer cells often feature changes to cell structures, um, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, um, the mitochondria, and the Golgi. And so here we are looking, let's go to the next slide. Oh. And so here we are looking at cells. And so this is actually an Edotech experiment. This is kit 990. Um, again, I don't have the right microscope to be able to visualize this with you, but I wanted to be able to show you the cells. Um, and so here we are looking at cancer cells and normal cells in culture. And so these aren't human cells. They're not biopsy cells, but we can use them as a model to represent the changes that we see in cells um, in cancerous versus normal cells. And so these are cancer cells from culture. Um, they're just not human cells. Um, so they're safe, they're, you know, appropriate for use in the classroom. Um, and you don't have to worry about, um, you know, any of the guidelines necessarily um, for using human cells in the classroom. Um, these are epithelial cells. And so we can see the normal epithelial cells that left are uniform and they're kind of a compact shape. They, there's some spreading, but they're, they're smaller. Um, they're in a monolayer, they're connected to one another. Um, and their cells are gonna have small nuclei. In contrast, the cancer cells on the right have random shapes. We can see that they're larger cells, they're much more spread out, um, and we don't have those nice connect tight connections between the cells. We kind of have a more disorganized arrangement. They're not forming a um, uniform multi-monolayer, and we can see that they have larger nuclei, and in one of the cases, it looks like there's multiple nuclei, and these are gonna be all hallmarks of cancerous cells. And so this is, you know, um, this is a simulation of what would have been done to Valerie's biopsy sample to determine whether or not the cells were cancerous. And so finally, you know, we are going to sequence DNA. So we are going to 
use a technique called Sanger DNA sequences to determine the identity of every nucleotide in a DNA sequence. And so as with PCR, um, we are going to use a short synthetic DNA primer to target a specific DNA sequence, um, in this case, just the starting point. Um, the sample to be sequenced is combined with the primer, the DNA building enzyme DNA polymerase one, and a blend of nucleotides. This mixture includes, oh, I need to take another sip, sorry. This mixture includes a high concentration of regular nucleotides. Um, so those are deoxynucleotides. And then they're gonna be a low concentration of dideoxynucleotides or DDNTPs. And the way these DDNTPs differ from regular nucleoside nucleotides is that they're going to lack the three prime hydroxyl group, um, which is important for forming the, um, the bonds between nucleotides and the DNA strands. And so we get rid of that hydroxyl group it's impossible for polymerase to add another nucleotide to the end of the growing strand. This prevents DNA polymerase from extending the DNA. And this becomes important in our next slide when we talk about the sequencing reaction itself. And so during our Sanger sequencing reaction, DNA polymerase one is going to read the temp DNA template and add nucleotides to the primer to build a complementary strand of DNA. Most times, again, because it's going to be a high, we're going to have a high concentration of regular nucleotides or DNTPs. Um, in our sample, most of the times a polymerase is gonna add a DNTP to the end of the growing nucleotide chain. However, when DNA polymerase one adds a DDNTP, so one of these modified nucleotides to the DNA strand, it's impossible for the polymerase to add another nucleotide to the end of the growing strand. And again, this is because the nucleotide lacks the three prime hydroxyl group that links the nucleotides to the, that links the nucleotide to the growing DNA chain. And this is gonna stop our, our reaction entirely. The stop the stops the building of DNA. And so because we have these DDNTPs, we're going to end up with a series of DNA fragments of differing sizes. And they're all gonna differ, differ by like one nuclear, when we line them up by size, we'll see that they, we, they each vary by one nucleotide depending on when the DDNTP um, is integrated. And so this is gonna allow us to determine the position of a particular base. So the shortest fragments from the DNA strands terminated near the primer, whereas longer fragments had more DNTPs linked before it was terminated and, the D and we get the DDNTP terminating the chain. So if you look at the middle figure here that we have, um, you can see that kind of growing um, labeled strands and we can see that each, you know, the terminal nucleotide on each of those um, is a different color. And so to read the sequence, these DNA fragments are separated by capillary electrophoresis. Automatic, machi automatic mated machines separate DNA fragments through a polyacrylamide gel formed in a thin capillary tube. Importantly, each DDNTP is labeled with a different fluorescent marker, allowing the sequence of a particular DNA strand to be read by a laser that's focused on the capillary. As the DNA fragments pass through the gel matrix, the laser excites the fluorophores on the DNA. The four different DDNTPs fluoresce different colors that are automatically detected and the fluorescence intensity is translated into a data peak. And so I'm gonna move, so you can see, uh, I'm going, let's go to the next slide. So we're gonna read some chromatograms. I'm gonna turn off the light for now. We're gonna come back to the gel in a minute. Let me move this out of the way. Um, so the kit 314 is actually going to come with these different um, chromatograms, one for each of Valerie's five children. Um, and so we are going to sequence through a small region of the P53 gene in each of the kids. We can see all of these peaks. Each nucleotide is represented by a peak in a different color. So our eight, we have, and we have the key right here. It's kind of hard to read. But A is green, T is red, C, G is black, and C is blue. Um, and it is, let me turn my ring light back on to see if I get some better definition between the colors so that you guys can read along with me. All right. Um, I was joking with someone, I have a ring light for my science samples, not for my face on screen because they are more important than I am in these workshops. I wanna show you guys the best possible um, results. And so we are gonna read our sequence. So this is Sheila's sequence. 
And we are going to read here from left to right. Um, and we're going to go through. And so we could see here we have a black. So this would be like G, T. And then here we can actually see, you know, we have two peaks that are in the same place. You're generally going to read the higher peak um, for the um, sequence. Um, so we have, you know, what is it? G, T, T. And then we have G, G. And here we have blue C. Um, we don't have any on here. We don't have any polymorphisms on here. But in some cases, you might see you get like um, if you were sequencing a particular gene, you might get two peaks um, that are one on top of the other about the same intensity. Um, that suggests that you may have an A on one copy of your genome, a T on the other copy. And then when you start to get towards the end of the sequence, you know, this sequence read is good all the way throughout. But when you start to get to the end, you start to see very low peaks. Um, it's hard to distinguish. It's hard to tell, um, you know, which um, nucleotide it is. Um, you know, you, there is a limit to the length that we can sequence with Sanger DNA sequencing, usually like 500 to 800 nucleotides, um, based, best case scenario. So by the time you get to the end, you might start to see the peaks all became the same size, um, and it's really hard to distinguish between them. And that's normal. That's just a result of the process, um, you know, but you, you may have to put in, you may need two primers if you want to sequence the entirety of a gene. We're just sequencing a 90 base pair section. And what you would do is go through um, and then your students are going to write down the identity of each of these nucleotides um, and they are going to go to online databases um, to determine what nucleotide changed and then what effect that has on the protein. So does that make sense how we looked at the chromatograms? Um, does anyone have any questions at this point um, before we move on? Just let me know. You can put them in the chat box. I can always come back to this at the end as well. Um, but I'm going to get back to the electrophoresis again. So let me bring this back. Get that light turned on. So you can see the bands are really progressing um, through the gel. They look great. All right, so let's talk about what's going on in this gel. Um, again, here's a little bit of a little summary. While we were chatting, our samples were running through the gel and separating by size. And so, um, you know, for those of you who have attended one of my workshops before, I know you're old electrophoresis pros, but I do like to go through the nuts and bolts of the process just to make sure everyone is on the same page. And so, you know, as I mentioned in this experiment, um, electrophoresis is being used to separate DNA fragments by size due to the chemical neat structure of DNA. Um, so the sugar phosphate bands that are gonna hold the nucleotides together, the DNA backbone has a strong negative charge. So in our gel, we locate the wells of the gel near the uh, negative electrode um, of the gel. Um, and then we load the samples and turn on the current. And so the current is gonna push the DNA from the negative side of the gel through the gel to the positive side, right? And again, that's the electrical current flowing through the gel, the DNA is flowing along with it. Now let's talk a little bit about the gel. So at first glance, our agros gel appears to be a solid at room temperature. Um, if you were to pick up the gel, it feels like a thick jello. Uh, it's still soft. Um, it's not super jiggly, um, you know, there, there is firmness there. Um, if we're looking at it at the molecular level, um, what we can see is that the gel is full of pores, which are basically microscopic little tunnels that pass through the gel. And these tunnels affect how the different sized molecules separate into bands and, and how they can move through the gel. As the current is pushing and pulling the DNA fragments through the gel, the molecules have to find their way through these pores. They may have to twist or turn or change their conformation to be able to get through the channels. Uh, and so since it's easier for small molecules to move through the gel than larger molecules, the DNA separates into bands by size, with larger molecules remaining near the wells and smaller molecules moving further down the gel. And so because the molecules with different charges travel at different speeds, they become separated and form discrete bands within the gel. And so I kind of think about this as like fish going downstream or trying to swim upstream. And we can think about our DNA molecules like the fish. We have some fish that are large and some fish that are small. 
They are moving downstream with the current. We may have rocks in the river or a fishing net that spans from bank to bank. These obstacles are going to get in the way of our fish as they travel through the stream. Smaller fish are able to navigate through the tight twists and turns or fit through the holes in the net more easily than the larger fish. And this means that the smaller fish would travel downstream more quickly than the larger fish. And so we can think about the fish as our DNA molecules, the current of the stream as our electrical current, and the obstacles as the agarose matrix. So if we look at the results of our DNA electrophoresis experiment, we're going to find smaller bands at the bottom and the larger bands at the top. We always run a molecular weight marker with DNA bands of known size so that we can determine the sizes of unknown DNA fragments in our experimental samples. But unfortunately, we have one more problem. DNA is clear and colorless, and so we can't actually see these bands with the eye. So we need to visualize it using a stain that sticks to DNA. And there are many stains that are available for use in the classroom lab, but my two favorite are going to be Flash Blue and CyberSafe. And so CyberSafe is included with Kit 314, Flash Blue is in and Flash Blue is included with both Kits 115 and with 314. And so Flash Blue is a visible DNA stain, uh, meaning that it binds to DNA and it can be seen by the naked eye. And it's super easy to use. Um, after we talk about through this gel, um, I'll show you a blue stain gel just so you can take a look. Um, and so I like to do, there, there are two protocols that you can use to do it. One is a quick one that takes about 20 minutes. I like to use the overnight protocol where you dilute flash blue and soak the gels overnight. Um, and this is a great option for short lab periods. So you can run the gel, you can soak it in the stain and then visualize the results the next day. And this gel we're using CyberSafe, which is a fluorescent DNA stain. And so Cyber is going to work in the same way. It binds to the DNA to label it. Um, in this case, we add it to the gel so that the stains the DNA while it's running, which is great because with the edge system, we can actually visualize the, the, the DNA moving through the gel at the same time while it's separating. Um, we don't have to spend a lot of extra time staining the gel after running it. You know, your students can get their results right away. You know, especially with the edge unit, you don't have to take the gel out and put it on a separate transilluminator. You just take your cell phone, take a picture. You got the results right there. You can tape it into your lab notebook. And so each DNA molecule is decorated with a CyberSafe molecule. And we visualize it by shining blue light through it. Again, the, um, let me move this over so you can see kind of like my hand goes into a slot here on the side um, and there's a paddle that turns our blue light on and off. And that blue light is going to excite our CyberSafe molecule. And when that molecule is excited, it emits light. And that's what we can see here. So let's look at the results. So we can see the bands here on our gel um, very clearly. Let me actually see if I can bring the camera even a little bit closer. Um, I have a gel here on the screen as well. So you can see here we see our bands. And so this gel has been running for 25 minutes. Um, and you can see we've got beautiful separation um, between the different bands. Um, on our gel in just that short amount of time. And so our first lane, as I mentioned, is our standard DNA fragments. Um, those, that, that's basically um, a region that lets us um, determine the size of our fragments. We know the size in there. Um, I actually just posted a video to YouTube recently on how to use a DNA ladder and how it helps us in the lab. So if you wanna know more about that region, definitely check it out. Um, lane two is our control. That is the normal and mutated P53 gene, which possesses no restriction at sites for the enzyme. So we can see that we get one large band. It is not cut at all right there. Um, in the second lane, this is gonna be Valerie's blood sample. So remember Valerie did not have blood cancer. Um, and so what we see here is we have one normal P53 allele, which is undigested. Um, and we have one mutated P53 allele, which has the point mutation and thus it could be digested by our enzyme. And so as she still possesses a normal P53 allele in this tissue, uh, the tumor and the cancer formation um, is suppressed. If we look here in lane four though, what we see is all of our DNA has been digested. So we get those two separate bands um, that, that show that the DNA has been cut. And so our mutated P53 is now present in both alleles um, in Valerie's genome. She has acquired a second hit um, in this tissue, 
which then become these cells become cancerous because she doesn't have a normal p53 tumor suppressor gene to prevent the cells from dividing uncontrolled and so if we look at her normal colon tissue dna so this would be um, you know, DNA taken from colon cells that were near the tumor, but not in the tumor. Um, and we could see that, um, you know, Valerie has one mutated allele and one normal p53 allele. And so again, this, the tissue surrounding the cancer is still healthy because it only has one copy of the gene mutated. Oh, thanks Maria for putting the, the DNA ladder video um, in the chat box. Definitely check it out. Um, take a look. I think it's a really great video that talks about how we use the ladder um, in the lab and why it's so important. So I'm going to wrap up. If there are any more questions, um, be sure to put them in the chat window. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Um, and, you know, if you have questions, put them in the chat box now and I'll answer them. Um, you know, I'll answer them when I'm done with my wrap up. But I think, um, you know, I didn't talk much about the different kinds of cancer, um, but it really is important to realize that cancer is not a single disease. It is actually a group of diseases, but all of these diseases are characterized by the uncontrolled cell, by uncontrolled cell division. And so they're gonna be different in every tissue, um, but you know, we see some of the same things happen based on the, um, based on the genetic makeup of the cells. In some individuals, cancer is inherited, um, and so inherited cancers are much more rare than, than you know, spontaneous cancers. Um, but when we do have a person who seems to have a family history of cancer, we can use a family pedigree to determine, you know, whether they may have a cancer gene. Um, you know, we can diagnose cancer in many different ways, including looking at the cell morphology through biopsy and by sequencing the DNA um, to determine what changes might have happened to the genome. And so, you know, we just looked at one gene, um, but now um, researchers are actually making entire cancer genomes from patient samples to determine not single changes, but multiple changes that happen that can cause cancer. And so um, the one thing I really like about using this lesson is that it's relatable. You know, most people um, have been impacted by cancer, you know, either through family members, through pets, you know, my, my I have family members who have cancer. Um, my cat died from cancer. Um, you know, like most people have been affected. And so they have some idea of, of the cancer. Um, and, and so they have a personal relationship and they would like to learn more. Um, and it's also important for a person's individual health um, so that they can be informed patients um, should they become affected. Um, and so this gives us a place to talk about the cell cycle, to talk about molecular biology, my molecular biology, genetics, uh, and many different um, techniques and analyses that can be done in the biotech lab. And so we are going to be posting the slides. If you haven't filled out the link already, um, please click on the form that Maria put in the chat. Um, let us know if you have any questions, if you wanna learn more about the experiment. Uh, I'll follow up with you in a few days with the professional development certificate um, and any other information. Um, you know, we're happy to, to help you get this technology into your classroom in any way possible. Um, again, I use the Edvotech Edge today for this experiment. If you have questions about this new unit, definitely contact me. Um, but the experiments that we did today can be used with any electrophoresis chamber, um, you know, including our M12 and our M36. Um, so if you have questions about that, again, put it in the form. Uh, be sure to like this video um, and subscribe to Edvotech. You know, we're constantly putting new content online. Uh, there are a lot of ways to get in touch with us. We are very accessible. Uh, we can be contacted by email at info at edvotech.com. Um, you can call us. You can interact with us on social media. Um, we try to answer our comments uh, in the... Um, we try to answer our comments in these videos. So if you have other questions, you know, feel free to put it in the video and we'll try and get back to you. Um, you know, we just want to help you um, bring biotechnology into your classroom in any way possible. Um, if there are no questions, um, you know, we're just hitting 4.30 right now. So, um, you know, I'm going to wrap up the stream. But again, we're, I'm so happy to be here with you today um, to talk about biotechnology. If there's anything um, that you need, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you know, tr 
try info at edvotech.com, try one of our social media channels. Um, you know, we look forward to helping you get biotechnology into your classroom. Um, so if there are no questions, I'm going to wish you all, um, you know, a great month. Hopefully we'll see you back here next month for another biotech stream. Um, if there's anything in particular you want to see, um, you know, leave it in that form, tweet it to us. You know, we are looking, we want to do workshops that you want to join us for. Um, so definitely let us know and we will be in touch soon. Um, so thanks again for joining um, and happy biotech, everybody. Um, happy summer vacation for most of you. If you're teaching in the United States, at least you should be done with the school year by now. Um, you know, we got through this year um, and next year will be better. So have a good one. Stay safe. Bye now.